Hi, hi. This is uh, Professor John Argalaska uh, with uh, uh, some reflections on uh, being a brainwave therapist, Chapter One, by uh, Bonnie Badenoch. Uh, we had a previous video on the introduction, which uh, actually was quite meaty. Uh, this chapter is very short, uh, but uh, likewise has uh, some good stuff in it. Um, I love the way Bonnie starts out saying that um, the way that uh, for instance, B.F. Skinner and, and Jung and uh, Freud and, and anyone else who had formed theories about how psychotherapy should be done or what the nature of the human mind is, uh, how she called them myths of the human mind, uh, it really uh, reflects our incomplete knowledge of all that's going on with the human mind. In fact, nobody knows what the mind is. Uh, we know that it arises at least partially out of the brain, but we also know that it exists separately from the brain. Dan Siegel has a great book out, oh, <laughs> it's a little bit dense in places, called Mind, which explores uh, the characteristics of the mind. Bunny right away states her goal in chapter one as uh, wanting to weave a tapestry with the warp being the scientific knowledge that we now have of the brain. And her book was published in 2008. And remember that the decade of the brain took place 1995 to 2005, where knowledge and uh, non-invasive neuroimaging just exploded, uh, giving us so much new information about the brain that would be the warp of uh, this tapestry that she'd like to weave. That warp, of course, is uh, interpersonal neurobiology. And the weave is the subjective experience, uh, and she calls uh, that uh, integrating the inner community, which we'll be talking about later on, which she discusses in the book. Both of these things, the warp and the weave, together with knowledgeable compassion, compassionate relationship, are what uh, forms the glue that makes therapy work. She uses an analogy of um, taking in and baking in uh, knowledge and concepts. And she suggests that you take a moment to pause and reflect on what you've read, which is something I've gotten into the practice of doing. It makes my reading very slow. <laughs> to put it mildly, very, very slow. I underline, I highlight, and each time I underline and highlight, I reread what I have written. And of course, remember Donald Hebb's principle, neurons that fire together wire together if they fire often enough. Um, not only that, this brings to mind uh, Ted, uh, Ted or is it Dan Hansen? I'm not even sure. The guy's last name is Hanson. He has uh, a concept called One Good Thing, and he has a website. If you Google One Good Thing, I think you'll find it. He suggests that the good things that happen to us during our everyday life slide off as if they were received by Teflon. Uh, and that's because there is not a lot of survival value in remembering those things. The bad things, however, stick like Velcro, and those things uh, our body tries to protect us from by remembering all the cues that went along with it. If it is a traumatic experience, then those clues generalize far beyond the clues that we received before uh, being traumatized. Those, of course, become triggers for people who have PTSD. Um, now, uh, what he suggests is that when something good happens to you, that you take this and mull over it for at least 30 seconds in an effort to cement that memory in your mind, much the way that Bonnie Bonanox suggests uh, reflecting on your reading so that the concepts will uh, stick. Uh, I was walking up to Antioch, and some of you may have heard this story on Coda, uh, and a gentleman was on the sidewalk before me, and he said, you know, are you tribal? Because I like to wear feathers. And I said, no, these are just decoration. Well, he said, well, they're nice. He didn't have to say that. It was a nice experience, and um, it was it was uplifting for me, and I decided to think about it a little bit, and it stuck with me. That probably happened two years ago, but it was just a, a random person on the street. He probably was homeless, interacting with me, and giving me a compliment on my feathers. It was something he totally didn't have to do. It was a spontaneous act of compassion. 
Um, so I recommend that you do that as well. The good things that happen to you take at least 30 seconds to think about them so that they stick. The idea is to get enough of these things in your mind so that when you go to sleep at night, right before you go to bed, these are the things that fill your thoughts. So Bonnie's suggestion on page four to reflect over what you read is a good one as well. Uh, you want these things to stick in your mind. Now I have a question for you as you engage with these uh, ideas. What emotions are you experiencing? Uh, for me, I get excited about some of these things. I really get anticipatory also of using these things with people that I meet, with students, with clients. What emotions are you experiencing as you read through some of these very, very avant-garde, exciting ideas that are on the cutting edge of the field of subjective well-being right now. So think about that. Louis Cosolino describes it, uh, describes one of the ingredients that's necessary for success in therapy as cognition with activated emotion. And I've coined the term cogmotion to describe that, cognition and emotion activated together. Don't just look at the intellectual left hemisphere side of the concepts that you're encountering here. Allow your emotions to color your experience. Allow your emotions to um, anticipate what it will be like to be able to fully utilize these ideas with a client. So that's something that I want you to uh, try to experience. Um, I, I love some of the way that she uses language. One of her quotes on page five, I, I want to quote this, many years of research tell us that the single most important ingredient in effective therapy, regardless of paradigm, is the empathic capacity of the therapist. And she's citing Hutterer and Liss in 2006. Um, she also earlier referred to taking in and baking in a new body of knowledge. Um, well, in both therapy and in this taking in and baking in of uh, new knowledge, empathy for ourselves, compassion for ourselves, empathy for our client is what turns the heat up in the oven and causes the dough to rise. So this is just a chapter that covered only a few pages and uh, it, it has some really neat stuff in it. Chapter two gets into brain information that you can use in psychoeducation with your client. And if you remember in the introduction, Bonnie recommends doing that. I do it as well with my clients. And uh, you have to be careful about how it's received. Some people honestly don't care, uh, but others are intrigued by uh, precisely uh, what's going on with them in a more uh, scientific sense. So I want to challenge you to something. I want you to be able to speak interpersonal neurobiology. And so there's a few terms that I've picked up from chapter two that would be neat for you to integrate into your vocabulary so that these become second nature when you're talking with clients. And the first one, of course, is uh, neuroplasticity, simply the possibility that the brain can change in in all kinds of ways throughout the lifespan, barring organicity, some sort of disease function. Neuroplasticity, synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, and neural integration. Those are the three processes of uh, neuroplasticity. Synaptogenesis is, of course, growing new synapses. Neurogenesis, growing new neurons. And neural integration is the rewiring of existing networks and that's exactly what we're doing when we're working uh, with clients in therapy. We're encouraging them and providing the oven that provides the heat to make the dough rise. We're providing the circumstances that will allow neuroplasticity to happen. And while I'm here on this point, Bonnie also makes the um, uh, she brings in the concept that memory is something that changes every time we retrieve it. Dan Siegel talks about this as well. Now, consider that each time a memory is called up, the circumstances under which it's called up become a part of that memory. 
So if your client is able to recall something that was unpleasant without becoming dysregulated, that's really, really important, or approach that memory without becoming dysregulated because you risk the danger of re-traumatizing them if they experience the mo emotional dysregulation of that original event in talking about it. So you have to be extremely careful with that. However, if they can approach it in a sort of a narrative, biographical, historical way, perhaps from a third-person perspective, then what is going on between you and them becomes a part of that memory. And I've often described this as like a spiky ball. It's a, This traumatic memory is difficult to pick up because there's spikes all over it. But every time you're able to go back without becoming dysregulated, crucial thing, you shave some of the spikes off of that ball. Enough of that and the ball becomes smooth and can be held. And at that point, the client has a narrative biographical historical narrative. It could be something like this. I did not deserve what happened to me when I was attacked when I walked past the park. That was totally out of my control and it was horrible and it messed me up for a long time but I now realize that that is in the past and I can choose my reaction to it. And so I can actually consider it and talk about it and relegate it to the past so that it does not color my present ongoing experience. That's an example of a, a narrative, historical, biographical narrative that denuders um, a traumatic memory. Uh, limbic system, lizards, snakes, reptiles, fish, okay, they have this marvelous system for survival that works well for them. Uh, they have fight or flight. Uh, and uh, when they are triggered, they go into defense or they go into fight mode. Uh, and the organs that uh, operate this limbic system are the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the hypothalamus. And Bonnie goes over the function of those uh, in uh, this uh, chapter two. Uh, the hippocampus is the seat of memory, uh, much of our memory, uh, the um, uh, explicit memory. Uh, the amygdala is our smoke detector and is probably the seat of implicit memory. That's memory without words. And remember, and remember, <laughs> remember, remember that implicit memory formed before you had the capability of speech in the infant caregiver relationship forms what Bowlby called your working social templates, what I call implicit social templates, that color your expectations for how interpersonal relationships are supposed to unfold. And we do not experience those as having learned them. We experience those as part of ourselves. And it takes some good psychotherapy to be able to discover if we have some implicit social templates that are pernicious. I had those uh, very briefly. My mother never picked me up out of the crib. She was of the school that if you pick them up when they're crying, you're going to teach them to cry. That's the way she was raised. And as you know, inter, um, implicit social templates and attachment style tend to be transgenerational until somebody breaks the chain. And as a therapist, you have to be one who has broken the chain if you emerge from childhood with insecure attachment. My attachment was such that I grew out of childhood with such neediness that I was always pleading for attention, especially from women that I hadn't gotten from my mother. Tell me I'm okay. Tell me I'm okay. Please tell me I'm okay. It's not a good way to be. And then I had the paradoxical effect because I did not like myself and I didn't think I was worthy of anyone's attention or love. Then I would drop them if I got a date with them. Fire and ice, horrible way to be. I have a long suffering wife who has put up with me and has helped me out of that pattern. Uh, and I also had two wonderful psychotherapists, one of whom is Mariam Hamida in Westlake marvelous psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapist who helped me to uh, 
be able to discover that about myself and to give me enough nurture to be able to develop a new set of implicit social templates. And when you develop that uh, post childhood, it's called earned autonomy. Secure attachment that you have achieved post childhood is called earned autonomy. Well, thank you, Miriam. Um, now, uh, also, you need to know that the prefrontal cortex, commonly abbreviated as PFC, is the seat of executive control. It's also of interest to you to realize that the left side of the prefrontal cortex is involved in approach, and the right side of the prefrontal cortex is involved in avoidance. Uh, often, and this is a side note, um, in an EEG pattern, you can see hypoactivation of the prefrontal cortex on the left side and hyperactivation on the right side. And those people are all avoidance, sometimes uh, agoraphobic. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, big a lot of terms, but it's good to have the ability to let this roll off your tongue. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. You could even try singing it. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the seat of memory, narrative memory. Now, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does not come online. The orbitomedial prefrontal cortex is online when you're born, and therein uh, are stored many of those implicit memories that your amygdala is also holding together. And there's quite a, a profuse connection between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex, because here is the place wherein we can achieve affect regulation of the limbic system. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex comes on late. Doesn't really get totally online till four or five years of old. And most of us do not have narrative mem memory, semantic memory, before four or five years old. Sure, you might have a, a memory or two of being in the crib or something very significant about your mom, uh, but they're isolated. Almost all of our narrative semantic memory is formed, is stored in the uh, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Some in the hippocampus as well. but. Uh, the significant part thing is that these don't come online until about four or five. And so the formation of implicit learning goes on, especially in the first two years, zero to two, but it continues until speech develops, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex comes online, and then you have narrative memory. How many of you have memories before four years old? I ha my earliest memory is when I was about five years old. Um, it's of uh, a rectangular hassock with this crazy blue flannel. F I can feel it. I can see the colors uh, in front of me uh, that was in my parents' uh, living room. Uh, and I have a couple of other unpleasant memories too, but those are, those are the earliest memories that I have. Now, a significant thing about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, let it roll off your tongue, get used to saying it, because it really... Um, will help you to be sophisticated in explaining what's going on with the brain to clients when you're doing psychoeducation. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the seat of semantic memory. It comes on late, about four or five, but guess what, folks? It checks out early. All right, here I am, 70 years old, about to turn 71, and my dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is weakening. I find myself struggling to remember people's names not just simply the tip of the tongue phenomena, which is the kind of thing that happens when you see someone, you know, I know I know this guy or girl, I know him, I know him, I know him, and you struggle with it for a little while, let it go, pops up in your consciousness hours, maybe even a day later. Uh, you started a search engine running when you struggled, it ran beneath your awareness, and when your, your search engine hit upon that uh, answer, it fed it to your consciousness. It's really fascinating. That is an example of a process running beneath awareness in your subconscious, which is, of course, what I try to do in hypnosis. I try to put things into seed a person's unconscious. So much runs in our unconscious. Thoughts like, uh, automatic negative thoughts like, they aren't going to like me. I'm not going to succeed. 
I'm going to get into an accident. Okay, those uh, ants should be crushed. Get them. Automatic negative thoughts. Anyway, I try to, in hypnosis, that's something I do. That's a total aside. Um, okay, what else have we got here? Hebb's principle, good old Donald Hebb. Neurons that fire together, wire together. But remember, only if they fire often enough. You should know Donald Hebb's principle. Pruning, a large amount of pruning, which is apoptosis, cell death, good word, apoptosis, cell death that occurs at about three years old to narrow the uh, number of active neurons in the brain. And this is a good thing because it makes for organization. Uh, there is also a pruning uh, event in adolescence. And Dan Siegel talks about this. And during adolescence, if, you, if one experiences a significant amount of emotional dysregulation, it's possible that that may aggravate or over prune the brain. And Dan speculates that that is the reason why in late adolescence or adolescence period, so many diseases, uh, pathological diseases of the mind emerge, schizophrenia, bipolar disease, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, may result from over pruning of neurons during adolescence. That's a speculation of Dan Siegel. Glia, the glia cells, which outnumber all of the other neural, neuronal uh, components of our brain, uh, is Greek for glue. I didn't know that. Greek for glue. Glia cells clean up our uh, the neural debris, so to speak. They also support neurons. They're responsible for laying down myelin, and they may have other functions that we aren't completely aware of yet. We don't know everything there is to know about the brain. Glia cells mean glue. Myelin. My, oh my, myelin. We have two vagal nerves. We have a myelinated vagus, which is the most recently laid down evolutionary uh, in evolutionary sequence a portion of our social regulation system according to Stephen Porges who will talk about it another time we have an unmyelinated vagus which is primitive that we share with reptiles uh, the myelinated vagus is so much faster uh, there's a cute little song on uh, YouTube uh, if you uh, google polyvagal blues you'll find it. And it's just a cute little song, about five minutes, about uh, the polyvagal system and uh, the vagal nerve. I hope this stuff um, is making sense to you. I hope it is having some emotional impact on you, as I believe it should have. Uh, I get excited about this stuff. It is, um, it is so utilitarian, and it is so functionally important in relating to clients. So bless you. I hope that you enjoy this. I will be getting another video to you shortly. Take care.